we ask that you speak clearly into the microphone. You'll have a maximum of three minutes and there is a timer visible from the podium. When the light changes from green to yellow, your time is coming to an end. When the light turns red, your time is up. Note that you may also choose not to speak if other speakers before you have said what you wanted to say. Shouting, cheering, and loud noises will not be tolerated, and violators may be removed for disrupting the meeting. Goodyear City Council meetings stream live on Facebook and online at GoodyearAZ.gov. Thank you for your participation in tonight's meeting. I'd like to call the regular meeting to order on September 28, 2020. Please join Councilmember Pazillo in the Pledge of Allegiance and the invocation. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Almighty Father, I am asking for your help in providing calm over our country for a society that desperately needs your assistance in moving us forward in a positive manner. There appears to be a lot of anger in the world where some have lost the ability to rationally communicate with others to solve critical issues facing this country. I ask you to provide guidance to our various elected leaders so that they can successfully address issues facing the nation. I ask for you to protect all our men and women in uniform serving here and abroad keep them safe while performing their job in very challenging times. In your name, amen. Thank you, Councilman Pazilla. It was a very meaningful prayer tonight. We are all present, and so I'm going to ask the city clerk, Darcy McCracken, now to give him information on how the public may participate this evening. While the Goodyear City Council meetings are open to the public, the occupancy has been reduced to implement social distancing. Seating is generally available on a first-come basis, but meeting attendees will be cycled in and out if necessary to allow for speakers to speak on certain agenda items. If you wish to speak during a regular meeting, please complete a speaker's card so that we may ensure you are in the room for that item. Face masks are required and must be worn when moving throughout the building. Our residents still have several ways to address the council. They may submit their questions and comments to public comments at GoodyearAZ.gov. And during the meetings, they can view the meeting using the link from our agendas using Granicus. I believe our Facebook and our YouTube are going back and forth right now. Um, after the meetings are completed, they can also be viewed on YouTube. The public may always contact the mayor and council at any time by sending an email to gycouncil at GoodyearAZ.gov. Thank you. We have one communication item tonight, and this item is a recap of the summer recreational program. Acting Recreational Superintendent Deanna Ortez presenting. Deanna? Good evening, Mayor and Council. Thank you for allowing me to come recap our summer programs. This summer, we partnered with Healthy Verify, which was a group, uh, the Rose Law Group, medical professionals in Arizona State University. We were able to provide modifications and develop safety standards to safely offer our programs to participants as well as staff. These protocols helped reduce the disease transmission, and also limit potential exposure of COVID-19. Our summer recreation program this year, and as in many past years, is a very important program to our community. The kids had been in virtual school for approximately six weeks plus, and just really needed some social interaction. So we were able to have four program locations so we could limit the amount of kids to 50 participants per day. The program was offered Monday through Friday from 9.30 to 3.30, and this gave kids the opportunity to still engage with others and have some fun this, during a normal summer. Our first session was five weeks in length, 
and the Avondale Elementary School District Superintendent Betsy Hargrove asked if we could extend an additional two weeks to have a program because school had been delayed. So the kids all in all, they wore masks and they were in groups of 10. They rotated through the various activities throughout the day. So they still were able to participate in arts and crafts, video games. They were still able to do our presentations like we have in the past. They just rotated the various groups and so they were still able to have a lot of fun. Our aquatics program was one that we were able to still remain our regular scheduled programming. It was open the weekend of Memorial Day and went through the weekend of Labor Day. We were about a third of our normal capacity. So we had about 50 participants that went to the pool daily. Uh, we were also able to have our cardio wave program, which is our fitness program. And we just really adapted things this year. When we onboarded our staff, we did everything virtually. So all of our interviews were held virtually. Um, we trained our staff in smaller groups. So there were 10 people or less to a normal summer. We trained everybody together. And so we just did things a little bit different. We were able to do seven uh, new operating procedures to help maintain our staff and make sure that everybody's safe. And at the same time, it gave kids and families the opportunity to still enjoy the pool. It was a really hot summer for us. Our adult softball program is another one that we're super proud of. We were basically the first and only municipality to offer a summer softball season. So we had two nights of co-rec and two nights of men's leagues. And although we encouraged you know, people to social distance and they wore a mask when they were in the dugouts and our plaza area, it still was an opportunity for about two hours for adults to really just escape the day-to-day -day stresses of life. So we were very thankful that we were able to offer that program. The last program I'd like to uh, talk to you about, I would like to introduce our staff, Parker Gore. He has been the face of our e-gaming and streaming program this summer. And he is a recreation programmer and is going to share a little bit about that program. He was the face and the persona for Goodyear East Gaming. Welcome, Parker. Thank you. Uh, council, Mayor, uh, so on this slide kind of gives you a bit of the details and numbers that we were able to accomplish uh, through this program this summer, um, some pretty good numbers. Um, we were able to partner with Peoria Parks and Recreation Department as well uh, to offer uh, an immersive live streaming gaming ex experience for all of the kids in the West Valley. Um, they were able to play popular games such as Overwatch, uh, Minecraft, and Fortnite. Um, and they were also able to see themselves on the stream while earning uh, Amazon gift cards, Jimmy John vouchers, and more. So pretty cool program. We're excited to keep it going, and we, we are really enjoying it. So this concludes our presentation of some things that we were able to offer this summer. Well, this is pretty spectacular. So con any comments from council? Councilman Loretano? Both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, my kids are older now, they're in high school, but when they were younger, they'd attend programs like this. If we not ha would not have had this program for the working parents, I can tell you, if there weren't these type of programs when my kids were that young and this would have happened, I would have had to quit my job because you can't do it. <laughs> um, COVID's been hard for, I have lots of friends who have younger kids, so thank you, you probably, well, there's a lot of moms and probably some dads that were able to keep working through this and support their family because of what the city did. And for the e-gamings, that is so cool. I'm so glad you're keeping it up. That is just so much fun. Uh, may maybe we can have, um, like, you guys play against the kids, too, which would be interesting, like they did the NBA players. <laughs> <laughs> you, you probably could do it. Maybe Brandon. He's probably the age that could do it. He'd probably be pretty good. We'll, we'll have him be... Uh, 
maybe a guest star. <laughs> so again, from the bottom of my heart, thank you because you don't know how important this is. I'm sure you do, but you know what I mean? It's just, it sounds like keeping it going two weeks or just even having the program, it's pretty important to the working parents that are just like pulling their hair out still. So thank you. Councilman Vasillo. Yeah, I think council member uh, Laura Tana kind of hit it on the head, but Chris, I wanna thank you for finding creative ways to keep the public uh, engaged. Uh, we've had some very challenging times as you all know, and to be able to get them engaged to do some crafts, get them out of the house and like council member Laurentano mentioned, maybe getting some parents freed up now that they can get back to work. Cause I think some of the biggest challenges with the school, et cetera, is even now that they're going two on and two off, what do the parents do on the two days at home? You know, I mean, it's very, very, very challenging to try to get back in there. So I'm glad Goodyear stepped up, found ways to creative to get these kids out there and uh, as opposed to sitting home. <laughs> and uh, thank you very much. Councilman Campbell. Well, thank you, Deanna and Parker and David, wherever you are, and all your staff. This is wonderful, but I really want to commend you for reaching out to the kids and do the gaming thing. That's where they're at now, and that's where you're going to get the biggest bang for your buck for them, and you're going to get them interested in our rec programs just by offering something like that. So thank you so very much. Our kids are online all day. Well, not all day. I'd say four or five hours a day now for school and they, they're enjoying it and they're not enjoying it, but they do love the gaming and they love to be able to interface with other teams. And so this is great. And thank you for being so innovative to the way you trained everyone and you did the, the virtual training and then you had everybody together and then you hired them and everything. That's just amazing. But then, you know, Goodyear's very uh, good at that. We know how to improvise and we know how to get the job done. So thank you all so much. And, and uh, I have a couple of friends that played in the softball league. Mm -hmm. They were absolutely thrilled to death that they could get out of the house for a couple of hours and go play just to burn off a bunch of that energy. And you're right. We were the only ones that offered that. So thank you all so much. Councilman Campton. Yeah, a lot of the same, everything's pretty much already been said, but yeah, thank you so much for being innovative and pivoting and and still pursuing these options for people where a lot of cities didn't didn't continue or pursue these different options for, for our kids and families. Because to everybody's point, I mean, I know working families, they definitely rely on this a lot for keeping their kids having something to do while they go to work. So I know this is, even non-COVID, this is an extremely popular program that I, I definitely think is very important for the community. So I appreciate you keeping it going. I appreciate also, yeah, trying the e-gaming, which is obviously a success. I know a lot of kids, I mean, they love doing that as well. It really is the only thing we could do right now. So, but thank you for, for being innovative and helping with that. So thank you very much. Councilman Kano, did you want to speak? Well, it, when you get down to the end, there, there's not much to say, but uh, not only offering the service as a benefit of the family, but I was just really thinking about the, the mental health and the social well-being of the children too, how important it's been. It's been a long, uh, a long siege in, in many ways. And so providing this service, uh, continue, maintaining some continuity, of uh, essential services really has just been important. Again, thank you for your innovation, your creativity, for making, for finding a way to make it happen and, and doing it well with excellence. So thank you. Thank you all. I think I sent a text or an email. This is an award-winning event that you gave this summer. Absolutely. It's now become, this would be a primary model for the other cities. I'm not sure any of the other cities did it, but none of the mayors talked to me about it except the parks were closed. So really, I, um, I would like you to take this further, and we need to advertise it just to say how great our council and how creative they were for the summertime. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Thank everybody that worked on your team and, of course, all the volunteers that helped you get through this. So spectacular. Thank, thank you, you for you. the comment. For people that are listening, they pause to clean the table and the microphones. So we're 
following the COVID rules. Thank you. Now is the time for citizens who would like to address the City Council on any non-agenda item within the jurisdiction of the good City of Goodyear. Are there any speaker cards? No, Mayor. All right. Does anyone in the audience want to speak? All right. Since that, we'll go on. Will the City Clerk please read consent agenda items 2 through 8 by title only, please? Number 2, approval of minutes. Number 3, approve the fiscal year 2021 budget transfers. Number four, approve expenditure of funds for purchase and installation of replacement water meters. Number five, approve the final plat of Cantamia parcel 38 subject to stipulations. Number six, approve the final plat of Cantamia parcels 39 through 41 subject to stipulations. Number seven, adopt resolution number 2020-2096, approving an intergovernmental agreement with Maricopa County for the annexation, construction, operation, and maintenance of Perryville Road from Indian School Road to 300 feet north of Campbell Avenue providing authorization, direction, and an effective date. And number eight, adopt resolution number 2020-2109, delegating to the city manager or her designee the authority to exercise the city vehicle designation exemption pursuant to Arizona revised statutes 38-538.03. Thank you. Does anyone on the council wish to remove an item from this consent agenda? I, I, need to, I knew you were going to do this. So I've, got, I've got a question for you. So. Um, do you want them to come up and, and make you a presentation? Would you rather have us vote on the rest of them so you'll have that time afterwards? Either way. I, All right. Well, then. I'm not opposed to the item. I just think we've. Okay. There's so a lot that needs to be answered before we do it. Yes. I oh, four. I have the same question about number four. Okay. I'd like a presentation. So can we bring staff up? Since there's a presentation, should we go ahead and. Um, we don't always have to, I don't think so. Do we? No. But we've done we're this. We're going to have before. a presentation. You should handle it separately. So, oh, but it's more okay. Than a well, we've done it before, which surprises me. But we'll just go ahead and do that. Okay. So then, um, could I have a motion to approve two through eight? Is it two through eight? Yeah. Wait a minute. It's number four. So move. No. Do I have a motion is second to approve. I'm sorry. Two through three and five through eight. So, so I have move. a motion from Councilman Campbell. Do I hear a second? Second. A second. A second. From Vice, from Vice Mayor. Uh, roll call vote, please. Vice Mayor Stiff? Aye. Councilmember Pizzillo? Aye. Councilmember Loretano? Aye. Councilmember Campbell? Aye. Councilmember Hampton? Aye. Councilmember Kano? Aye. Mayor Lord? Aye. The motion carries. Okay. So the item pulled from the consent is to approve the expenditure of funds for purchase and installation of a replacement water meters. So we have Public Works Director Javier Sotovich will present. Javier? Javier? No. It isn't really that. How about now? No. Yeah. yeah, okay. That's better. I apologize. So thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, I wanted to share some information. I can't believe today, uh, two days from now, is my fifth year with Goodyear. So time flies. Yeah. So I appreciate all the work that uh, you've let us do mm -hmm. uh, to bring value to the city. So I, I have an overview of, of the project that I'd like to share. All right. Um, essentially, uh, this project, you saw this project in our capital improvement program that was brought to you as part of the budget process. Um, and is this project is part of our improvement in our asset replacement program for utility assets. Um, Wanted to share some of the victories uh, associated with this program. As you know, the IWMP in 2016 identified several projects that really focus on the system reliability uh, and the safety of our system. We needed to know that we had water and the infrastructure to move that water to our residents. Now we're at a stage where we can maybe do some improvement to our system, even at the point of delivery. And so what we're looking at is we're looking at uh, replacing about 10,500 meters, which is a little over 50% of our meters. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason why we're doing that in one chunk is that a lot of the, as you know, a lot of the development that took place in Goodyear took place in about at the same amount of time. Mm -hmm. And our staff was replacing about three to 400 meters a year with internal uh, forces. And, and staff fell a little bit behind. And it is time for us to reset our asset management program and get those meters replaced at this point. 
Also, those meters give us the ability to potentially in the future add some more, be a little bit more smart as to how we manage our water that can help us not only operationally, but also with water conservation goals and so on. Um, the project is, um, uh, there's really, associated with that, there's really two, two main benefits of that project. Um, meters, as they get older, over 10 years old, they start running a bit slower. And so what happens there is we start losing revenue. And so we want to make sure that we are um, accounting for all the water that we deliver, but also from a regulatory perspective. Um, we report to the Arizona Department of Water Resources on all the water that is unaccounted for. Like, we don't know where that water went. And, we're, and we want to make sure that we know um, very accurately how much water we deliver as compared to how much water we produce. So those are great benefits from doing this program. Um, the project is... Um, composed of several elements. We are requesting this evening a, uh, for you to approve the expenditure of $3,890,000. Um, of that, uh, $3,122,510 is for the purchase of the meters. Uh, $402,815 is for the installation of the meters by a contractor. Uh, we have an allowance of $24,000 for some public outreach um, that will be part of this project in about an 8.75% contingency of $340,675 as part of the request this evening. Um, the project is a one-time request for this amount of money. The project will be delivered this fiscal year. Uh, it is scheduled to be delivered this fiscal year. And then from that point on, we will continue to replace meters through our operational funds with internal staff. We project probably that we're going to uh, look at about 1,000 meters a year replacing as our system ages. Um, and I think that's just an overall view. I'm not sure if you have any questions. Okay. Can I let him answer the question, or do I have to do the vote first? Uh, motion is second, and then you can okay. open up for and, and after I can. Okay. Council, uh, Vice Mayor Stiff, you had a question? Oh, yeah, you did. Motion is right? second. A motion is second. second motion. motion is okay. second. I thought he said I could go on that. <clears throat> See, I can't hear you up here. I know. I'll Even with my here. hearing aid help, I can't hear you. So you have to speak up. All right. I need a motion and a second. Can I hear that motion? So, so moved. moved. I heard a motion from Councilman Campbell and a vice, and then a motion from Councilman Fazil, the second. Okay. And we can all in favor? No, Are no, you no going to go questions. roll call? No questions. Question. Question. Now you can do the discussion. Okay. Thank you. Just keep me going, guys. All right, Councilman Vice Mayor. I may hit your question more because I hit seven of them. Oh. <laughs> um, Better listen carefully. And I got a go through which ones you actually touched on. Um, you said this is a one-time purchase of $3.8 mm -hmm. that we're going to do 10,500 yes. meters. And that represents 50% of our system as it is right now. We have over, we have over 20,000 connections. Yeah, and, and just round numbers, right? So 21,000 meters. If we're doing 10,000 now, and we only do 1,000 a year after that, it's going to take us 10 years to replace the other half. Correct. Yes. Is that sufficient? As we, I mean, you know, just mathematically, it doesn't make sense that we're, we're 10,000 meters behind, and then we're going to drag our feet and, out. And that's there. a great observation. That 1,000 that that target is our first year replacement. In fact, as our system grows, that number is going to have to grow with it as well. Now, have we done this? Previously, have we done a giant group? No. So the so my memory of this, which is why we're having this conversation, um, is the, was all the preliminary talk getting through CIP. Is that this is the only time we've replaced? Yes. A large section yes. of meters. Okay. Um, and we haven't replaced any other than op, just simple operational. We haven't done any large group bundles in the past. This is the first. To this range, never, no. Obviously, not in the last five years that I, I'm aware of. 
and that thousand a year replacement you think is going to be absorbed in the regular operational budget? Yes, we, we, we are requesting uh, additional funds to be able to do that. Okay. And every year it will increase. Okay. I'm not, I, I'm not objecting at all to the concept of doing this. I think, I think it's appropriate. I mean, obviously we need to, we've fallen behind, we need to catch up and we need to move on. So that is not, not my issue. My issue was there were a lot of questions that were left in the council action report specifically to how are we spending $3.8 million? What kind of a project is this one time? Is this going to be 3.8 for five years? What's the, so that was the genesis of my, of my question. It is absolutely not in opposition to spending this. So thank, thank you. you for the presentation. Councilman Kano, you had a question. I do. So on behalf of our citizens who are very interested in water conservation, you did make mention that uh, this will help support it. I know that when you, there was a citizen committee, part of the presentation and things we studied were modern uh, water meters that had increased technology and capabilities that would allow the resident, the water user to interact and, and engage water use and things like that. We talked about irrigation controls. I was just wondering if you would touch uh, on the water conservation aspect or what's the possibilities in it and if there is a timeline okay. to address them. Thank you for that question. So um, the ability of this meter, the the, the the immediate benefit of replacement of these meters, as I mentioned, is operational. Um, we will get a better sense of, and in fact, that by itself already has a link to our conservation. We'll get a get better sense of how much water we're actually delivering as compared to producing and gives us a better sense of where the leaks might be, if we have any leaks. Um, in the long term, these meters, and if you look at what smart meters can do nowadays, and these meters have the ability eventually to be able to do several things. These meters have, right now, the immediate benefit is our ability, instead of having to go to the meter and take a reading, we can drive by and take that reading. So there's going to be um, a lot of benefits to that operationally. Um, additionally, these meters collect a lot of data. But at this point, they're not sending that data anywhere because we have the ability at one point to, um, if we so desire, to install receivers throughout the city to collect that data. What that does is gives us the ability to create, um, again, a tighter control of our system, but also to give our citizens the access to a portal of information for them to manage their water usage, usage even better. So there are a lot of benefits on the long term there is a, still a lot of work for us to get to that. Councilman Campo, did you have a question? I just wanted to share um, how you're, I'm on Liberty, because I'm north, uh, and I've had two meter changes. One was uh, maybe five years after we moved in, we had a problem with it. And now mine's digital, and it tells me if I have a leak, they just drive by and stick out a little stick, keep going, so it saves lots of man hours. And they can tell me so much with my water. And, and we're just now catching up to what the other water companies have done because we're still kind of in our infant stage in getting our water company up to where it should be. And it does sound like it's an awful lot of money, but it needs to be done. And it's just, if we can get them all done, I, they said they would be probably changing out this new digital that I've had for seven years in another five years. So it's not like this is going to last the, the life of my house. You're going to have to replace them, but it'll make us a lot better. Water smart, you'll know where the water's going and you know how much people are using. Good, and that's correct. really important. Correct. It's collecting a lot of data and we certainly create information with that data. And, and Council Member Kano, if I can add some something else to the, the question of... Um, um, the use of these meters for conservation. We, we have in our conservation program a pilot. And that pilot will um, focus on interacting with engaged citizens to prove the value of smart meters. And these engaged citizens will have the ability of tapping into a portal, have information that is strictly focus on their water usage and so on. And so we plan to use that information to come back at some point and discuss certainly first with staff what the next move will be. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Councilman Mazzillo? Do we have any idea of what percentage of water loss we have? 
Yes, yes, we are. Um, the state starts getting worried when a city is around 10. Uh, we are about eight and a half or so. But we know intuitively we, if we measure our water better, we, we can tighten that number. But you don't have a dollar <clears throat> impact on what that may be from a revenue standpoint? I, I couldn't give you now one, but yes, we, we, we have a revenue loss estimate because of that. The only reason why I ask is that kind of offsets the, the capital expenditure you're putting on there. And, and I don't want to assume anything, but this is all coming from water funds, correct? Correct. And part of our plan in the long term is to take a sample of these meters and to get it measured what our return possibly is because of it revenue-wise. Yeah, it's my, it's, it's, it's my understanding they always slow down when they start going bad, so you're losing, you're losing revenue. How yes. much? 10%? 5%? It would be nice these, to get a feel for that because that may convert into quite a lot of money that's <laughs> not being collected right now. Yes. Councilman Laura Tano. Um, the smart meters, that sounds interesting, the pilot program. So would that have the ability to tell, like, the homeowner, like, when you go on APS's website, how much power you're using? So it's like, oh, i got to cut back. And so before the end, you don't have to wait to your monthly bill at the end? In, in our pilot program, huh? um, you'll have those that are interested in participating, and we, we're creating a strategy for that. And it's going to be a very small group. Those residents will have the ability of getting that information real time in their phones. Okay, so yes, yeah, same type of thing. Great, that's mm -hmm. that's wonderful. Thank you, Council Hampton. So I just make sure to miss something as well. So this is getting brought here today because we didn't feel like it was budgeted in the FY 2021, but we're bringing it. We needed to bring it up sooner. No, no, this is just the implementation of a project that was approved as part of the capital program. Okay, I just wanted to verify. And then, yeah, I'm all on board with the meters, having the smarter meters. I think that'll be it's smart. It's, it's, good to, it's good to have that as well, just so people can have more ready data available for leaks and things like that. And I'm sure, do we have anything in the system where we can tell, like, line breaks quicker um, throughout? I'm sure the meters would help with that as well. I mean, if we have a, a real-time system what, what, that when, checks, checks When those, it comes to... To system issues, um, and we'll be in front of you a little later to talk about SCADA, um, our SCADA system and how it monitors um, water use, water distribution and pressures and so on, um, that data is a great indicator of the health of our system, including some sudden leaks. We, we would be able to see those right away. Yeah. No, I, and to your point, the, the power example, I know that power companies do the same thing so we can re reroute water or different things here and there so okay we Thank can you. we can actually be smarter than APS and what I've seen so yeah <laughs> vice mayor you know uh, council member Pizzillo brought up a good point about water loss is it possible for us to get a yellow paper or something on this rating of what you said is at 8 or 8.5 can we get more information on that at a you know some other way um, talk a little bit about our water loss rate, where you think it's going. I mean, we're creeping up to that number that makes the state worried. Well, I would rather not be anywhere near that number. Sure, sure. We, we, we would love to do that. In fact, we're doing some work through AMWA to um, um, get better sense of how we can manage that as well. So we can certainly put something together. Yeah, I mean, there's no rush. I know everybody goes, oh, my God, we got to get this out Friday. If it takes two weeks to get it, let's just get the right information. But um, I, I would be very curious to know what we're where we think the waste is going and what we're doing about it, um, you know, just for future, future sake. Just, just um, um, to give you some peace of mind, our, the information that we have and our, our intuition tells us is about tracking water rather than losing real water. I've recently moved and I've been tracking water, right? Look at the city manager and I, she's gone to you, uh, <laughs> but uh, the water that's wasted for the water to become warm. Uh, and it, it just, I, I can hardly turn the faucet on because I know what the end result's going to be and I don't like it, okay? So um, it's very important. And I think the other thing you learned that the council um, is really interested in all the finer facts. And uh, because it is complicated, when you presented it before, uh, and we, we talked about this before, 
we have a tendency not to remember all those. And so I think this is great when any of you come up with water, uh, you can see the reaction you're getting from council. Uh, so I thank you for your patience tonight and for the information you gave. And I know they're looking forward to the next one you're going to come forward for. Thank you. So thank you very much. So we need to vote on this? Yes. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you. All right, on number nine, the first public hearing item to consider zoning ordinance text amendment F F MF-12. I'm gonna open the public hearing. Planning manager Katie Wilkin will be presenting. Katie. Thank you, Mayor, members of the council. Sorry. And if it's okay with council, I have a single presentation for um, business items nine and 10. That's fine. So we are bringing forward to you um, amending the zoning ordinance, which is item nine, and then amending the design guidelines, which is item number 10. And these both relate to the MF12 or single family rental products. So they do go hand in hand. You might remember um, we first brought some information to you about these single family rental products um, in October 2018. And then again, we came back to you in work session in August 2019 and discussed some of the design um, you've seen and some of the ones that have already built. And we got some direction from council um, on what you'd like to see in this type of product. So that's what we're bringing forward to you is to create a zoning district for this type of product and then design guidelines associated with it. One thing it's important to note is that by adopting this ordinance and these design guidelines, it does not obligate council or promote this type of development. What it does is set the standard should these developments come forward. So again, um, this MF12, um, commonly known as a single family rental type project. Um, and as I just said, we're trying to create establish the standards for these type of projects, um, but it does not commit to approving future projects of this nature. So in the zoning ordinance, um, you know, what's unique about this type of project is um, in some respects, it's like a multifamily and in other respects, it's more like single family. So you can see in the middle are the MF12 um, standards that we are proposing in the zoning ordinance change. And then I provided, um, you know, the, there, there's several single family districts. So I tried my best to kind of give you the average. And then we have an, um, two multifamily districts. So I gave you kind of an average with that too. So you can see um, MF12 is, they're typically, um, it, this would allow 12 dwelling units per acre. We've seen them typically around 12, 10 dwelling units per acre, the ones that are being built, but this would allow them to go up to 12. Um, so it's right in the middle of our alto, other multifamily projects, which are typically, you know, can go up to 24, where single families typically more like three to five. Um, the lot width is 200 feet, so it's a very large lot. And why this is important is we have had two projects come before council where they actually um, subdivided the property and are renting it out. That type of development would not fall in the MF-12. They would have to follow the single family standards or create a planned area development. This would be only for those type of developments where there's multiple units on one parcel. Um, the front setback is very similar to our multifamily district. Um, the building height is actually even lower than single family. And that building height is for the residences, um, for accessory um, buildings, such as a clubhouse, it's um, taken down to 12 feet. Um, the building coverage is, um, relates to the multifamily at 50%. And then again, they have to provide open space, meaning parks, pool, clubhouse, at the same rate as our multifamily developments. So, um, this is, there, there's a few other things in the zoning ordinance, but these are the highlights of what's in the zoning ordinance. So now I'm gonna move over to the design guidelines. Um, and what the design guidelines say is that these developments do have to follow all the other multifamily 
design guidelines. So again, in terms of designing parking lots and entry features and recreational amenities, um, all that, they have to follow the regular multifamily development standards. Landscaping, yes, thank you. Um, so you can see this is a Serafina project that's in Goodyear, so um, many of them are providing nice central amenities. What we did need to address was um, mostly the architecture and some development standards of these small units, because these small units act more like a single family development because there's so many more buildings than when you have a large building with multiple units in it. So what we've written is that um, two elevation styles will be required and of each of those elevation styles, there'll be three alternative color schemes that must be provided. In our single family regulations we have today, we require three elevation, we require three elevation styles with three alternative color schemes. So in this type of development, we are requiring one less elevation style um, just because they are smaller projects than most of our single family developments. We do also require a lot, um, we took a lot of the language from the single family development um, districts and put it in here, such as there should be varying lines, um, you know, the, the front door should be a focal point of the design, there needs to be pop outs around the windows. Um, so all that stuff that's in our single family is um, being, that's appropriate for this is being um, repeated here. And just this is an example, this is one elevation style and the three different color schemes um, provided in that one elevation style. And I just wanted to provide another example. This is another development that is being um, going through the process in Goodyear right now, and they provided three elevation styles. So these are the three elevation styles. Um, are those individual houses, these three? These three are actually um, duplex units. So there's two units in the one building. And I did want to point out too, is even if they came in with just these two, we would have accepted that, even though they're both kind of a craftsman, California bungalow look, the roof line is very different and they look different enough that we would have accepted those as different elevation styles. So the other focus of these um, standards, um, we've heard a lot about the perimeter lots, how um, we do, uh, you know, I do want to note, we do require four-sided architecture, even when you're inside the community, it needs to look nice, um, but we did want to pay um, special attention to these perimeter lots. Um, and I do want to say, you know, we have this picture up here, and one thing to be fair is landscaping is not in, and the landscaping yeah. certainly does help a lot. But um, it is fair to see, you can see one of these early developments that came in, it's all the same roof style. You can see it's, it's the same elevation pretty much. They all have this same feature. Um, this horizontal feature, feature and these vertical elements. So it is very cookie cutter. So um, on the perimeter lots especially, um, we do require variation in height and massing, varied roof lines too, so that you, can, you have to um, have different roof line types next to each other. Um, and then we also require a building separation of 15 feet. Inside the development, we require building separation of 10 feet, but then on the perimeter lots, they have to separate a little bit more. And just to note, some of these developments, I can't tell you exactly what these are, but some of these early developments were being built with more like five or six feet separation. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we are requiring greater separation. Um, another element I wanted to point out, this is actually, um, work we did with a development in Goodyear. You can see on the first um, go round, a lot of times we see this where they're proposing where these units, I call these, these units are buried. Like, you know, a single unit has buildings all around it. And so we do have regulations that require at least one side of a building has to have open air. So you can see what they did here is they added this trail so that there's more open space. So now these, you know, each unit has at least one side that's open, so natural light and air can reach the unit much better. Um, but again, you know, we've been working with some of these developments through PED, but now we're trying to create regulations for these type of items. Um, that concludes my presentation. We haven't received any in public input on this um, proposal and Planning and Zoning Commission did recommend approval by unanimous vote.
All right. Um, so I'd be happy to take any questions you have. Thank you. Are there any speaker cards? No, there. Would anybody on slide to speak? All right, I'm going to close the public hearing. Will the city clerk please read resolution number 2020 2087 by title only? Adopt resolution number 2020 2087 declaring a public record that certain document filed with the city clerk entitled Amendment 3 of the zoning ordinance. Thank you. Can I have a motion, a second to approve resolution 2020 2087? Do I hear that motion? So moved. Second. I've heard a motion from Councilman Kano and a second from Vice Mayor Stiff. Open for council discussion. Councilman Campbell. So Katie, I, I appreciate you trying to bring everybody under one umbrella, but I want to talk to you about the colors. So you're going, you're telling them they could have three color choices. So is, is it too restrictive for us to say you, you can't have 95% of your development in color A and then the rest in B? I mean, so many of our mm -hmm. units that are now being built, the apartments and, and the standalone uh, uh, rentals, they're all looking alike because the colors are the same on every single building. They may change a little bit in the front, but you really can't see that. What you see when you're driving by is the whole building. And I, I just really uh, don't feel a good vibe when seeing some of these buildings. They look like me to be prisons or they're just gray concrete they're not pretty and i know we're making them landscape it but i don't want to do something so draconian to the developer either i mean i get it you know it's all about money mm -hmm. but um i would hope that there's some way we could make sure that they do use a different color that they don't use just one color throughout the whole development which they could do we tell them you've got three choices and he said well I don't like any of them, but I'll do C. Then he could do them all in C, or she could. So, thank you, Council Member. Um, so one item is it's a minimum of three color schemes. So they could have five or eight if they wished. Typically, they won't do that because they're trying to keep costs low. So they want, sure. yeah, they mm -hmm. want to go in and paint everything one time and not switch out paint colors. Yeah. So a lot of them will just meet the minimum. Yeah. Um, so if we require three, I would expect a lot to be three. Now, this these type of developments are different than single family, though, because when, you know, in a single family development, you have people going in and choosing their house and they're choosing their color scheme. So sometimes in some developments, there's two color schemes that are really popular. Mm -hmm. And so you see the same color schemes throughout the development because the residents who bought the homes want those color schemes. But since these developments are going through site plan review, they're setting what's going to be painted what during the design review. So staff will ensure that there is, you know, that they're not going to say, well, here's the three color schemes, but we're actually only going to use one. Yeah, that'd be good. So that's part of the design review. And again, we see all that up front in this type of development. Okay, that would be great. Mm -hmm. If we just want it to look really nice and unique, because this, this is a new concept for us as well. And I, it just would make our city a lot prettier with prettier colors, I think. Absolutely. Councilman Hampton. So I do appreciate the perimeter changing as well. Mm -hmm. So what is the, what are our current court homes or is it comparable? Is there a comparable to the 15 feet that we have now? What the look, the look would be on the perimeter? Does court homes 15 feet on the perimeter as well or are they different? This is, um, thank you. Councilmember Hampton for the question. This is a unique regulation um, in our single family districts, including court homes. We don't have a perimeter versus other parts of the development um, regulation like this. Our single family districts do vary um, in essence from a 10 to 15 foot separation though. And that's where from the perimeter then it'll give it more of a yeah. look of a single family development and, and meet similar setbacks. Okay. To single family development. Yeah, I just was, yeah, I just want to clarify in my mind what that would look like. I do, I do think that the perimeters need to be changed because they do all look the same and just a row of very close houses all together. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if also you could, I don't know if we would need to, if there's an option also to add like a, maybe like a wall screening component, I don't know, just to make that visual of the perimeter maybe different as well. 
don't know if that would help at all. I'm just thinking like, for example, like the existing ones we have already, if there was some component that, I don't know, took off that look of all looking the same. I'm not sure what that solution, maybe it's just bigger plants. Maybe, <laughs> maybe it's maybe it's the more mature landscaping that would help, but I don't know if what your thoughts are, would that even be something practical in the future or not? Um, thank you. Um, I mean, in talking about the perimeter wall, some <clears throat> things we are looking at too is um, working with these developments to kind of match what's next door, if they're being built next, which they're often being built next to single family, is to try and continue the single family wall theming so it looks more like a total development and again, blends a little better, maybe mimics more of a single family development. Yeah. For the existing ones, there's not a lot we can do. Yeah. Um, the landscaping should certainly help. Yeah, yeah, I know we can't go back. I'm just, mm -hmm. I'm just thinking the future, what that would look yeah. like just to help it look different than the existing ones, mm -hmm. so. <laughs> All right, thank you. Councilman Gilbertano. Thank you very much for bringing this forward. Um, I think until they started getting built, these different developments, we didn't really quite envision how they were going to look, and I think they looked a little different than we thought. I drove around some of these different ones over the weekend and kind of looked at some of them, and I kind of got the same visual that Council Member Campbell did on some of them with just the gray mm -hmm. box. Um, mm -hmm. it, I, mean, I mean, I know the the floor plans are selling or renting out because people would, a lot of people would prefer that and they get their own little like yard space, which I think is very nice for these. So I do like the concept. My questions are what bother me about a couple of the developments, they're all flat roofs. Um, and it doesn't bother me as much when the different elevations all have different peaks. Like you said, you would accept those two different peaks. But when you're accepting a like two different types of flat roofs for elevations, I think that doesn't lead to any visual. So I don't know if that's something that we can talk about or what your thoughts are. And then I'll be quiet in a second. I have one other question. Like when we're talking about colors, are we going to ask them to be different colors, not light gray, medium gray, and Gray, gray, you know, I, so we can get a little bit more I think she's variety. This message. <laughs> <laughs> no, Thank you, Councilmember Loritano. Um, regarding the flat roof, that wouldn't be permitted anymore under these new regulations. And we have been, you know, again, like you said, I mean, they were new to staff too. I mean, they were really new to the valley. So a few of these came in with this flat roof concept. Um, but in requiring these three elevations, they have to have varied roofs. So if you provided different elevations and they all had flat roofs, you wouldn't meet the design guidelines. You would have to provide a hip roof and a flat roof or some other type of mix of the roof. So somebody couldn't come in with only the flat roofs um, unless they came to council asking for a deviation to that standard. So that, that one, we're good. On the colors, that's always, a, it, it, it's really interesting um, that, you know, we, staff through the design review process does try and get a mix. It's really interesting. Sometimes we really push for varying, varying colors and a, a lot of the developers really um, push against it. Yeah, I find it surprising because it's just paint. Can, the staff, the ones that are workers mm -hmm. can miss it. So mm -hmm. when you're building like that, the, they mm -hmm. get their orders and they go down the row. And so when you, when you change that, mm -hmm. then a supervisor has to make sure that they've got the right color. So I think, mm -hmm. it, I think it's just uh, an easier thing, less, less of problems, mm -hmm. less money involved in, in uh, having to recorrect something. So yeah, yeah, I shouldn't have been speaking up, I'm sorry. <laughs> Council Member Kano. Katie, on the architectural slide you showed with three elevations, three is a nicer, uh, gives a more variety than just two. Can you explain why we've settled for two? Is it undue hardship or? No, I'm, in, in all honesty, the simple answer is just, we thought there are smaller developments we could add to. If council was interest, more interested in meeting the single family and having three, we could. I think it would change it up. I that think about some Council of Lynch. these projects that are coming in that are quite large. Um, what comes to mind is the the two developments on cotton that for a total of 46 acres um, ha 
if something like that has one or two styles, it's going to be extremely monotonous. Um, in fact, in that particular one, I was curious if uh, there was any thought about before. I know we have we're change we're looking at changing them now, but is, are any of these standards going to apply to the ones that we've approved even recently? For example, the Hancock project with the total of 46 acres. Um, Thank you. Some of them, because, you know, we discussed in work sessions, so we knew what council wanted to see. Mm -hmm. So we have been working. So um, this particular one is from VITA Communities, which council approved um, a few months ago. I'm sorry, there's so many developments. I can't remember what's happening. That's when. a good thing. <laughs> so this is a council approved project. So again, we were, you know, they, they, they heard council loud and clear and provided multiple elevations. The Hancock one is also providing different elevations. I believe they're just doing two, and and I just can't remember off the top of my head. I know they were working with the color schemes. I think they were going to be doing some more groupings of color schemes, um, and they're not, um, and we worked with them somewhat on the perimeters, but they're not up to the level of these standards on the perimeter lots. Too bad, because it's such a large, it's going to be a large footprint there. Personally, I'd be in favor of three elevations. Mm -hmm. Vice Mayor. Katie, thanks for taking this on. <laughs> Appreciate that. I don't know that I heard the, the actual answer to do any of these new design standards apply to what we have already done? They do not apply do not. to, if the zoning is approved, it does not apply. Mm -hmm. So if we've done six of these in the community, it's only through their quote unquote generosity that we're getting any movement on this, correct? Right. I, I mean some of the zonings you've approved have these okay. concepts in them. You approve them with these concepts, but the MF twelve does not apply to any developments yet. That's what I thought. Okay. Um, the second question that I had is um, you know generally when we do these kinds of changes, very large scale, um, we work with a development community Mm -hmm. on these. We had a similar outreach and work with the developers who build this product? We've been working through them through the design process of, you know, kind of negotiating with them and that's, and some of these standards are what we know that we've been able to work through. Um, we didn't have a, you know, with everything going on, we didn't do like a um, special meeting on this topic or anything like that. We did do the notices as we normally do and haven't heard anything. Okay, thanks. Councilman mm -hmm. Fazillo. I'll make sure I understand it with the different color palettes. Like with single family homes, you can't have the same color next to each other. Is that what this would be as well? In other words, if there's three color palettes, you can't have the same color right next to each other. There's gonna be variation. Right, yes. I just wanna make sure that's there as well. Yeah, I, I wish it was like Councilmember Loretano, there was three more than two, only because mm -hmm. with some of these, uh, they get quite large. And um, I think with two, it's like almost every other one, it's they're going to get kind of monotonous, so to speak. I mean, in single family homes, you have several different <laughs> type of elevations when you build these things. And since they're so much closer, uh, uh, especially from the appearance, and I like what you did on the uh, perimeters. That's a big thing because that's what people see as they drive by, you know, um, and obviously they're selling because they're filling up. So the um, layout inside people are wanting because they're renting them. Uh, to me, it's more about the aesthetics, which you see in the community as you go by and they're trying to mix up some of these so it, they don't look um, all the same. And I know some of them out there, I wish we could have uh, mm -hmm. changed them. But unfortunately, you live and learn on some of these. So uh, I think we're moving in the right direction though. Thank you. Councilman Hampton. Well, reiterate. So, yeah, I do. I like the three options as well. And then also going back to the perimeter ones, I feel like some of the ones that we have currently out there, so like all of the accents and all of the differences to the buildings are all on the front and not on the, the back of the building. So I don't know if there's something that we can highlight around the perimeter ones, but there's more. It just seems like all the interesting visuals are in the front where the person's coming in, but the perimeter ones, they're just a block. They're just a flat block sometimes in some of the mm -hmm. projects that I've seen. So I don't know if there's ways to highlight the 
the elevations in the perimeter ones only. If that's an option. Some of them have trees behind them now. The yeah, it might be growing. Was but gracious enough after hearing some of the, the comments from our neighborhood mm -hmm. uh, to add more landscaping and put some trees, which mm -hmm. will help break that up, I think. So just so you know that, that uh, a developer came forth, a developer to do that for us, so. Yeah, no, I think those are great. I just was looking at some of those we have currently just to know if oh, there's I, more, I, more elevation on the rear of some of the perimeter ones. I know what you're oh. feeling because mm -hmm. I come from the age um, the things were built after the war and so our neighborhood looks at this like that kind of and the government built all of these homes all the same painted the same color and so that's where you hear from the the older group the elderly uh, because that they have some lived in them later on and they you know repurchased those after uh, they were sold so it, it, it that is where you're getting the comments in the public. So um, I think somewhat of it is valid on, um, I think where it's built, how it's built and lined up, like uh, lined up on, on the road on, on, uh, Pebble, on Pebble Creek Parkway in mm -hmm. Australia. Mm -hmm. so, so it's very difficult because where they're situated, there isn't anything except a little bit of landscaping. So. We have to deal with that because we zoned that for those homes. Mm -hmm. um, um, and I think it's very hard for the developer and builder after the fact uh, asking for things. So and it puts you in a tough position. Mm -hmm. So we need to be more cognizant, I think, of, of trying to come up with something that isn't going to, to break the bank, <laughs> uh, but that will have some, a little bit more distinction in the neighborhood. So, you want to talk? Okay. Another, I'm another, sorry, Councilman Hampton, go ahead. I got another idea, but I'm not. The, <laughs> so, so also, I mean, I think part of my issue sometimes is that they're all they got the wall, and then they're all lined up exactly the same. So, I don't know from a developer's part how they could work it out, but maybe even just a little staggered. Like I've seen a single family, you have one stories that are on the lot, positioned on the lot differently versus the single story. So. I don't know how that would work or if it's even feasible for them, but even just a little staggered in the perimeter as well would break up that wall and then another wall of house exactly at the same size and elevations. So, Well, I will we'll say thought. that I have been in some of them and they're very nice inside. They're they're right? They've done very, I mean, I was just, the kitchens are nice, the it's, setup is nice. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, they are valuable. I would live in one. Mm -hmm. um, so. I, I think they're doing a good job, and I think the I think the comments are uh, constructive. It, it's better for us to uh, um, have a, co a conversation on something like this for the future ones, where you have control over the beginning. But we have to remember one thing: it's costly. So when you're talking to a builder developer, you have to keep that in mind, and um, because it's not easy out there for them to develop these big patches of land. So any other questions? I think we're, everybody down with their questions? Okay, Laura? I know that a number of us have expressed interest in the three elevations versus two, so I don't know where we go with, with that. Well, we, we, we can't. Thank you. I'd suggest if um, the city attorney agrees that you could um, approve it with the change that it should be modified from two elevation styles to three. They would just make a motion to amend to require three elevations on the zoning change. Mm -hmm. Well, so, all right. So we're going to add a motion to this presentation. So I need, Bill, you want to give me a motion? I actually don't think it's for this item, no. Are we on the... You're right. It, it's That's in the design guidelines, not the zoning yeah. ordinance. Oh, so okay. the zoning ordinance. Yeah. Okay. Be... So we can go ahead and vote on this one yeah. now. All the conversations finished. Roll call vote, please. Vice Mayor Stipp. Aye. <clears throat> Council Member Loritano. Aye. Council Member Campbell. Aye. Council Member Hampton. Aye. Council Member Kano. Aye. Council Member Pizzello. Aye. Mayor Lord. Aye. The motion carries. All right, so let's go to, will the city clerk please read ordinance number 2020-1476 by title only, please. 
Adopt ordinance number 2020-1476, amending article three zoning districts of the Goodyear zoning ordinance, providing, providing for severability, providing for an effective date and providing for penalties. Can I have a motion a second to approve ordinance number 2020-1476? I hear that motion. I think we add it now. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to approve the, uh, the uh, design guidelines as read correcting to three elevation styles. I think we're still on the wrong item. Uh, Darcy, we're still on. Yeah, we're still on the, <laughs> Sorry, one, on the wrong item. Thought. So on. We're trying. We're going to make it on all three. Uh, next one. <laughs> all right. Never mind. I made a motion. Well, all right. So then the motion stands as it is. <laughs> right. All right. So uh, open for council discussion. No discussion. Roll call vote, please. Mayor, I didn't get the second on that. I third second. Thank you. Sorry. So, Vice Mayor Stipp? Aye. Councilmember Campbell? Aye. Councilmember Hampton? Councilmember Kano? Aye. Councilmember Pizzillo? Aye. Councilmember Loritano? Aye. Mayor Lord? Aye. The motion carries. So, just to clarify this, where is that going to that motion going to take place? On ten. On number ten. On number ten. Number ten. No, I just want to make sure that we know. We're doing it twice. Yeah. yeah. Should we the we next know. Slide? Are you, yeah, are you going to present? All right, number 10. That's what I'm asking. Okay. Yes. I just want to make sure. Hearing, so. so, next public hearing oh, is to consider amending multi family residential design. We have uh, public meetings now open. Katie, welcome. Thank you. I have no further information for my yes. presentation. All right. Would anybody, any speaker cards? No, ma'am. Anybody in the audience like to speak? think so so I'm going to close the public hearing and will the city clerk please read ordinance number 2020-1477 by title only adopt ordinance number 2020-1477 amending chapter 3 of the city of Goodyear design guidelines dated June 9th 2014 providing for corrections providing for severability providing for an effective date and providing for penalties thank you can I have a motion a second to approve this ordinance 2020-1477 and this is where this is the one and mayor I'd like to make a motion that we approve the resolution as read adding a change to a third elevation Katie you changed the slide so is that what it was third elevation yes a third elevation okay Do I have a motion a second second who did that okay or Kano is the motion and the second was I was the motion she was the second oh all right let's go on open for council discussion councilman Campbell so if we're going to do three why not four I mean you know let's this is our time to change it I would have never gone for three but since three of us want three why don't we do four and then it'll really change up the development so if they all won't be cookie cutter looking like the same because one and two are almost identical there's just just the roof line is a little bit different not those the other ones yeah there we go see we'll go one and two up and down those two are pretty much alike and that's the only really different standout one it's like all of us that have the 30 foot ceilings and then next door is a uh, an adobe flat roof you know what I mean the roof two, the two with the uh, roof lines are different well those two are different in that one but if these are huge big developments why not have four why not have a choice of four different elevations well, if you go by I, I'm not sure that uh, and from our perspective I'm not sure that's uh, going to be acceptable for a builder developer I don't know why not I would say dollar bills I would say and, and just, when they plan these projects and the architect puts them together uh, you know they they have that in mind of, of what the consumer wants well they try to sure. do, they they do what the I mean they do polls all the time to find out what the market is it's market driven the designs I are. know so I'd like to ask Katie for the staff that came up with this what was your rationale and why thank you um, our rationale was simply in the single family standards, we require three elevations and these are smaller in size. So we threw out two. Um, and again, kind of our experience working with the developers on um, what they have, um, it, it was not any deeper than that. Well, then if we stay with three, we're not doing anything any different than we already do on the multi-housing. 
in the so yeah, they'll right. all look alike anyway. So, okay, that's fine. All right. So let's did we vote on it yet? Because now I'm so Not lost yet. in this. We're, we're all <laughs> set. Yeah. Yeah, are we done? We're all done. Okay, we're done. So, Vice Mayor Stitt? Aye. Councilmember Hampton? Aye. Councilmember Kano? Aye. Councilmember Pizzillo? Aye. Councilmember Loritano? Aye. Councilmember Campbell? Aye. Mayor Lord? Aye. The motion carries. Okay, so are we down to business now or we have the last one? We still have number 11, another public hearing. Number 11, okay. All right, so um, number 11 at the bottom, so because I'm a little lost tonight. So I'm going to close the public hearing. Is that where we're at? Do no, you have to open it? Open them. You're on number 11, open so open the public yeah. hearing. Yeah, oh, at the top? Okay. A final, a final hearing. All right. I thank everybody for staying with me tonight. I'm not quite. Got you off track. Yeah, I know. I've got myself off. And, so. And actually, Mayor, that's yeah. our fault. We don't have the open. All area. right. We're number 11. Final hearing. Adams consider redevelopment area designation and plan update. Planning manager Katie again is presenting. Thank you, Mayor. Members of the council. We've talked about the redevelopment area and plan many times over the years. Happy to be here before you again to talk about it. So the city of Goodyear redevelopment area was first adopted in 2005. Um, there's been a couple amendments to the plan, but it was readopted in 2014. There was a change in the state law regarding the GIPLET program, the gover um, government property, I always get this wrong, lease excise tax. Um, and it said if cities wanted to continue um, having the option to use this program, that redevelopment areas had to be reestablished by October of this year. I do want to make it clear that we do have an existing agreement with Cancer Treatment Center of America. And regardless of tonight's um, outcome, that agreement stands and nothing council does tonight would impact that agreement. I also want to make it clear that although this GIPLET program is kind of the, you know, what started redoing the development plan, the plan itself does not obligate the city to use the GIPLET program. It does not advocate for the use of the GIP program. If the council wanted to use that program for another business, that would be a separate action. It would come before council. Council would decide on that then. What this does is simply keep the GIPLET program open as an option. If you do not um, readopt the redevelopment area tonight, then the GIPLET program wouldn't be an option. And the reason is to use GIPLET, the property has to be within a redevelopment area and within a central business district. So going on, um, and let me also just say that um, we are, staff is not proposing changes to the boundary of the redevelopment area. Um, the redevelopment area is generally I-10 to the north, the city limits to the east, um, Broadway Road to the south, and then the Bullard Wash and partly Estrella Parkway to the west. And those are the original limits adopted in 2005. And again, there's no changes proposed. So I just wanted to go over um, some of the projects that we've done and some of what's in the program. Um, I do want, um, because we were trying to get through this um, quickly to meet the deadline, we didn't propose changes to the plan. We did update the data and information in the plan. Um, the other thing I wanna note that is important that's going on that council's already aware of is that with the um, CDBG entitlement, we'll be embarking on our first five-year consolidated plan um, and we're looking for a consultant now and we didn't see the um, need to duplicate efforts and hire a consultant for this study when that is going to be going on and that's gonna have a very robust outreach. And so our plan is, is once the five-year consolidated plan process goes through, if we need to go back and, re, uh, and amend this plan to add projects and programs identified through this pro 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 process, we can do that because we do use the redevelopment plan for the CDBG program sometimes. So um, again, we tried to just keep the plan intact, update data, not make a lot of changes so that we can get through it for this um, GIPLET program. So um, the first area is um, the Northwest area of the plan. Um, it includes the only residential that's 
currently in the redevelopment area, um, North Subdivisions and Historic Goodyear. Mm -hmm. It also includes um, some of our oldest commercial areas, some such as um, the Dysert commercial areas, Van Buren commercial. Um, there's also a school and church located in this area. Some of the projects we've done in the past is we've done several water line replacements of old um, asbestos cement um, pipes. We did improvements to Park at a Paz and Palmetier Park. There's been flood improvements. Um, recently, council did some zoning changes mm -hmm. um, for the neighborhoods in these areas to positively impact. And then we did used to run a housing rehabilitation and about 100 homes were rehabilitated over mm -hmm. the years. And this is just one of the housing rehab projects that we did in years past, a little before after of the same house. Some of the um, projects that are in there now that really impact this section are, um, there is still some water line replacement that needs to be done. There are um, areas missing sidewalks in the residential neighborhoods and areas that need ADA sidewalk ramps. Um, lighting, you know, council has, um, we started the project for um, northern subdivisions, but there are other areas where there's, um, could be lighting improvements. Um, we do have some aging commercial districts that are in, will need or in need now of rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. um, there used to be um, two grocery stores in this area. There's now no grocery stores in the area. So that's always a, you know, concern of how we can get more grocery stores in the area. And then there may, you know, we're always on the lookout for additional zoning changes that be, may be needed to help these neighborhoods that have unique needs. So looking at the commercial in this area, um, the Litchfield Corridor, this was actually the first plan that was ever done. There was a, um, in 2005, a Litchfield Corridor Action Plan um, for redevelopment of this important corridor. Um, Western Avenue is our oldest um, commercial area, so there is, um, you know, the desire as council's been discussing some of our buildings in Western Avenue a lot over the last year or so. Um, projects we did do is we did have a um, facade program and there were several businesses that took advantage of that. Um, we did do improvements along Western Avenue. The trees and the benches were done through the CDBG program and general funds. Um, the Urban Land Institute came out and with a technical assistance and made recommendations for the area, some of which have been implemented now. And then, although it's not in the city of Goodyear, the flight um, development on the county, the old Lockheed Martin is also a great benefit to the area. Um, some items that have been identified are continued improvements to the Litchfield Road corridor um, you might remember there was a program, um, Dress for Success, one time going, and that didn't go through. So um, I, I do think there's still some neighbors worried about the look of mm -hmm. Litchfield Road. Um, again, there's more commercial, aging commercial centers that are in need of assistance. And then we have our city-owned facilities that council has been doing a lot of visioning for lately. So then um, moving to the west, um, the northwest section, we have our I-10 corridor, the airport gateway at Goodyear Center, which is where um, CTCA is located, um, the Bullard corridor, Bullard Wash, and then there's additional commercial and industrial properties in this area. This area also includes our Superfund sites, um, but it also includes some benefits such as our foreign trade zones and then opportunity zone um, was designated in this area too, which um, gives tax incentives for development in the areas designated for opportunity zones. Um, and again, this area, I kind of went through most of these already. We're also making, um, you know, as I stated before, the city used Diplet to get CTCA into this area. Um, the city did the Van, Van Buren Street development. The city's invested by putting several um, city facilities in the redevelopment area, including new fire stations, the municipal complex. And then um, you might remember a year or two ago, we started working heavily on the Bullard Avenue corridor, having enhanced lands, um, what we could do to make that area look nicer. Um, what we see in the future is, you know, there'll be a lot of development along I-10. So, you know, what does the city envision for that? This section of the Bullard Wash is um, not fully improved, so the Bullard Wash is a big project. 
And then of course, um, the wellness park plan to the north isn't in the redevelopment area, but there were opportunities for connection identified with that old railroad underpass under the freeway that there are opportunities to connect to that, which would benefit the redevelopment area. In the south section, we have the Phoenix Goodyear Airport, the former Lockheed Martin site, which is flight. Um, and then the spring training complex isn't fully in the redevelopment area, but of course it greatly impacts it by being so close. And then the Union Pacific Railroad runs through this area. The other thing I wanna mention is um, impacting the redevelopment area is the proposed SR30. The route has been selected and it is moving a little farther north than we anticipated before. So it is going to, you know, again, it's, it's not located in the redevelopment area, but, he, but it comes um, very close to the redevelopment area, which could have a positive impact to the development of this south section of the redevelopment area. Um, and projects that were completed were the spring training development complex. Um, there's been several iterations of the Phoenix, Good, Phoenix Goodyear Airport master plan that the city always participates in and supports. And then there's been a lot of project develop, private development such as Microsoft that has received support from the city. Again, items um, that are in need, the Bullard Wash, I believe there are floodway improvements to the Bullard Wash in this area, but it hasn't been fully improved like it is north of I-10. Um, continued support to our partner of the airport and the city of Phoenix and operations of the airport. And then Yuma Road will be a future major improvement project of improving that roadway fully. So again, that was just a brief overview of the plan. Um, over 800 notices were sent out to everyone who owns property within the redevelopment area. We did receive a lot of questions and inquiries. Um, there were no concerns, mostly people were wondering you know, what does it mean to be in a redevelopment area? And when we explained that they've been in the redevelopment area, they understood many people had questions on, you know, is there a specific project happening? And so we explained the process, but we didn't receive any, um, you know, concerns or um, objections to the redesignation of the redevelopment area. We were required to go to Planning and Zoning Commission and they found it was in conformance with the general plan and recommended approval of the redevelopment plan. And so staff would ask that you redesignate the redevelopment area and readopt the redevelopment plan. Thank you. Are there any speaker cards? No, Mayor. Would anybody in the audience like to speak? All right, I'm gonna close the public hearing. Will the city clerk please resolution number 2020-2093 by title only, please? Adopt resolution number 2020-2093, renewing the designation of the city of Goodyear's redevelopment area and adopting a modified redevelopment plan pursuant to ARS Section 36-1474, 36-1479, and 42-6209F. Thank you. Can I have a motion a second to approve resolution number 2020-2093? Do I hear that motion? So moved. Second. That, was that Councilman Hampton? And second was Councilman Kano? I said, oh, Councilman, all right. Councilman Hampton, sometimes kids, when you say it, look at me or something. So, you know, say it a little bit louder. Because yeah. I'm looking down and looking up, and I know this is game with me, but come on, just speak up and help me a little bit. So that was the motion by Councilman Hampton and a second by Councilman Laura Tano. Open for council discussion. No discussion. Roll call vote, please. Vice Mayor Stiff? Aye. Council Member Kano? Aye. Council Member Pizzillo? Councilmember Loritano? Aye. Councilmember Campbell? Aye. Councilmember Hampton? Aye. Mayor Lord? Aye. The motion carries. All right, we're on to the business. I'd like Brian Council to wait till the motion is second before discussion. First item is to consider approving the preliminary plat for the Estrella Partial 9.20A. And he is here, Principal Planner Steve Caraccia for presenting. Mayor, council members, good evening. Uh, you have a preliminary plat tonight for you. Straya parcel 928. 
and that is located within a Montecito portion of Estrella. We have Willis Road here, Mountain Vista, Estrella Parkway up here further to the right. Uh, this is Cantamir right here to the east of 928, which is this parcel here bordered in the red. And basically it's surrounded by either existing or future residential development within Australia. And this parcel here is about a little over 20 acres and again, all residential character for this area. Uh, it is in the Montecito PAD, initially approved in 2008, updated in 2018. Uh, this parcel is designated for single family development with a minimum lot width of 50 feet. And that is the plan for this parcel, is to subdivide that area into 67 single family lots. Uh, that lot width will be about 50 feet wide, 115 to 120 feet in depth. And within this subdivision, all of the streets will be public. And this is the plan here, kind of wraps around this area here, the 67 lots. We'll have two access points to Willis Road, and then we'll have access through future subdivisions within Australia. And if those subdivisions are not built concurrent, they'll do a temporary access road to provide emergency access over to here. And we did find this consistent with the Montecito PAD. We did find it consistent with our subdivision regulations. Uh, as such, staff and the Planning and Zoning Commission, we are recommending approval subject to the 11 stipulations in the staff report. Uh, Mayor, that concludes my presentation. Staff and the applicant are here if you have questions. Oh, thank you. Do they want to speak? No. All right. Fine. I, I thought I saw Pete back there. All right. Uh, are there any speaker cards? No, Mayor. Would anybody in the audience like to speak? And I need a motion, a second, to approve a request for the preliminary plat for the Estrella Parcel 9.28 subject to stipulation. Right here, a motion. So, so moved. Move. Second. With a motion by Councilman Bazillo and a second by Councilman Campbell. Thank you very much. Uh, open for council discussion. No discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. The next item of business is to consider approving the preliminary plat of Goodyear Civic, oh, Civic Square, Parcel A. Sounds good, doesn't it, at Estrella Falls. Steve is now presenting again. Thank you, Mayor, Council Members. We're moving on to Civic Square. And tonight's action is parcel A. There's three parcels within Civic Square. And tonight we're looking at parcel A. It's a little over, it's almost 48 acres located here just east of the Bullard Wash, north of McDowell. This is the regional center here, Harkins right about here. Parcel B of Civic Square, well, we've seen that before. That's the BB Living uh, single family court home and townhome development going in right here. And then parcel C is a future multifamily development on a portion of this. And then we have commercial development here, uh, Live Goodyear, and then existing residential single family up in this area. So Goodyear Civic Square PAD approved in 2019. The intent was to create an urban pedestrian oriented development uh, for this parcel that was a center for civic administration and services. And with that in mind, they're going to subdivide, subdivide the 48 acres into eight lots. And so on these eight lots, we'll have a mix of civic, commercial, and high density residential type uses. Uh, right now, City Hall, uh, that's proposed on lot three, uh, Civic Park, lot four, an office and parking garages on lot six and seven. And this is the eight lot subdivision. Again, here's McDowell Road, 150th, running here at the bottom of the screen. The Bullard Wash here, running along the north. And here we'll have City Hall, the Civic Park, the office building, and then the garage. 
Uh, we did review this preliminary plat. We did find it consistent with the Civic Square PAD, consistent with our subdivision regulations. Uh, as said, staff and the Planning Commission, we are recommending approval of this plat, subject to the five stipulations in the staff report. Uh, with that, Mayor, that concludes my presentation. Staff and the applicant, we're available for questions. Appreciate that. Are there any speaker cards? No, Mayor. Would anybody in the audience like to speak? And can I have a motion and second to approve a request for the preliminary plat of Goodyear Civic Square Parcel A at Estrella Falls subject to stipulations? Do I hear that motion? So moved. Second. I heard a motion. I heard, heard a motion from Vice Mayor and a second by Councilman Laura Tano. Thank you. Open for council discussion. Okay, let's vote on it. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mayor, Council Members. We're on 14, the last item of business to consider approving water and wastewater SCADA development project. Public Works Director Javier Setovich and Chief Information Officer Justin Fair are presenting. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, so this evening we are here in front of you to request the, um, that you approve an expenditure of $1,502,000 for a water and wastewater SCADA project um, and it, they're related to budget transfers. Um, the criticality of this project is forcing us to bring it to you mid-year rather than as part of the CIP process. And I'll explain why. Um, the, the SCADA um, improvements um, um, are very important at this point. As we look at the merging of um, our water treatment facility into our existing system, um, we look at some critical elements related to that merging of those two waters. Uh, the great thing is that we're moving on schedule and we are going to, uh, we're looking at having that plant in service in December of 2021. And testing could start as early as September of next year. So things are moving forward uh, at, as expected. Um, as I mentioned, um, it is very critical that we're able to uh, support the integration of our plant into our system. Water chemistry of groundwater and surface water is very different. Um, also, as uh, this big bully, meaning the plant, starts putting water into our system, we're going to have to manage that introduction of water very carefully. The dynamics of the system itself change quite a bit. Pressures, water flow directions, and so on could cause issues that could impact our citizens through water quality changes. So we have to be very careful. Um, and the SCADA system is very important for that. So what is the SCADA system, right? It stands for Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition System. And what it is is really a series of intelligent sites that manage their own processes, and all these sites are joined together through a network. And what we're here for this evening is to ask you to help us support the improvements to that <coughs> network. Um, current state is IT. Our IT department has been working over the last uh, few years doing assessments of the SCADA network as well as maintenance and some improvements along the way. But as I mentioned, those dates where it is critical that we complete that work are quickly approaching. We, we are developing other strategies um, to decrease risk. And that's, that's where we really we want to mitigate some of the risk ahead of us. We have a great opportunity. We have new leadership in IT at this moment. And Justin um, um, has been able to really add a lot of value to the options that we were considering. And uh, we have Jacobs, who is the firm building the plant. And they are building the new SCADA system for the plant as well. And they have the resources and expertise to help us finish the work with our network. Um, and uh, again, as I mentioned before, the idea is that we want to move forward and reduce risk. And having one entity complete the work makes the most sense. Funding is, uh, as I mentioned, $1.5 million. Um, we are transferring half of that amount from savings that have been realized in the plant. And those savings are in the range of about $3 million. As the bids have come in for the work in the plant, we are saving uh, $3 million. And the other half is being um, funded by the wastewater fund because half of the system improvements also support the wastewater work. It is fair for the wastewater fund to pay for those as well. I'd like to mention that um, 
because of the savings of $3 million um, and some existing fund balance, uh, neither the current or future race to our citizens are being impacted by this work that we're requesting for you this evening, or from you this evening. So now I'd like to turn it over to Justin to share with you how he's going to move this forward, uh, this uh, project forward. Thanks. Thank you, Javier. And thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, I um, appreciate the time. Um, whenever I joined the city in, in May, I um, can you hear me? I'm sorry. Yeah, sure. It's it's on. Is that there we go. Is that better? Yes. There we go. Thank you. Um, so whenever I joined the city in May, I, I, one of the first things I engaged with Javier was understanding the needs because this was quickly brought to my attention because of the timeline. And that's why we're bringing it um, urgently now to, to for approval. Um, and so there is really an opportunity to uh, leverage Jacobs as a, as a partner and extension of our IT. Um, we have um, IT staff that are knowledgeable and experts in, in supporting the environment and supporting the network side. Um, and as, as Javier mentioned, as we bring these systems in line with one another, we really they have to really work closely in concert with one another and they have to work really well. So we uh, really view this as an opportunity for Jacobs to to lead this effort um, in order for it to be successful with integration of the new water treatment facility with the existing water distribution system. So um, our existing staff, um, we will work closely with Jacobs um, as well as public works through this process. Um, so we're excited about it. We're excited to work with um, work with them and what they bring to the table um, in partnership with that. So um, I'm open to questions. If, if you may have questions around the IT strategy side, um, and um, with that, I believe that concludes our presentation. Um, we will turn it over for questions. Thank you. Are there any speaker cards? No, Mayor. Would anybody in the audience like to speak? Can I have a motion a second to approve the expenditures of funds in the amount of one billion five hundred and two thousand for the water and wastewater SCADA, SCADA development project related to the budget transfers? Do I hear that motion? So moved. Second. I heard the motion from Councilman Hampton, and yeah, I, I got that one. Thank you. <laughs> and the second from uh, from Councilman Bazillo. So open for council discussion. No discussion? All right, let's vote on All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Nice presentation. All right, information items. Does council have any comments, accommodations, reports, anything like that? Councilman Lortano. Before Javier leaves, um, our water meter had a leak. Water services came out wonderful. So I don't remember the gentleman's name, but I want to give your team a shout out. Oh, that's nice. Anybody else? All right, I'm turning over to the city manager. Do you have anything to report? Uh, Mayor, I do not. All right, the next meeting will be on October 5th, 2020 at 6 p.m. No further business, this meeting's adjourned. <laughs>